Good morning. I'm Greg Longini, the board secretary of the Chicago Transit. On September 8th of this year, uh, the office of the secretary of the board issued a notice of change format of Chicago Transit Board for September 15th, 2021, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. On August 20th, 2021, Governor Pritzker renewed for a period of 30 days the statewide disaster declaration as a result of the pandemic. Pursuant to Section 7E of the Open Meetings Act, the head of the Chicago Transit Authority has determined that it is not practical or prudent to conduct an in-person meeting in light of the ongoing pandemic. This means that as permitted by this section, of the Open Meetings Act, there will not be any in-person public meetings and the Chicago Transit Authority public meetings on September 15th of this year will take place only virtually. Uh, Chairman Silva, we are ready to begin the Finance Audit and Budget, Budget Committee meeting. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to call to order the September 15th, 2021 meeting of the Committee of Finance, Audit and Budget with the Secretary called the vote. Yes, Director Miller. Here. Director Jakes. Present. Director Irvine. Here. Director Alvaro Rosales. Here. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm missing somebody. Miller, Jakes, Irvine. Uh, 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 Director Barkley. Here. And Chairman Silva. Here. All right, we've got all six members of the committee present. Let the records show that Deputy General Counsel Brad Jansen and President Dorval Carter are also in attendance at this meeting. And also that I, along with Chief Financial Officer Jeremy Fine, are actually in the building. We may proceed to agenda item number two, sir. Our first order of business is the approval of the committee minutes of August 11, 2021. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded by Directors Jakes and Irvine. Uh, I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Director Miller? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Irvine? Yes. Director Alvaro Rosales? Yes. Director Barkley? Yes. Chairman Silva? Yes. Motion's approved. Six has votes. On the number three. Our next order of business is the finance report. Jeremy Fine. Good morning, I'm Jeremy Fine, your Chief Financial Officer, and I'll be walking through uh, the results for the month of July as well as, well as year-to-date numbers. With regard to our July revenues, uh, they're following the same form that we've seen in the prior months here where we see fare box totals uh, slightly positive on both an amended budget and original budget basis, passes uh, slightly down on an amended budget and original budget basis, but overall, we're essentially at budget uh, slightly down on an amended budget basis and slightly positive on an original budget basis. With regard to our reduced fare subsidy, uh, those continue to come in as expected. However, uh, that is a haircut to what we have traditionally received uh, in reduced fare subsidy and lower than what we give out in terms of free and reduced fare rides. With regard to non-fare box totals, uh, they're slightly down on an amended budget basis and an original budget basis, which leaves us for the month uh, you know, essentially flat, slightly down um, by about 1.3 million on an amended budget basis and about 600,000 on an original budget basis. If you flip to the next page, you see the year to date numbers. Uh, and again, we see positive variance on the fare box, uh, you know, plus and minus, uh, you know, about budgeted uh, levels, uh, but down about three and a half million and positive by about three and a half million on passes on an amended budget and original budget basis. So overall, again, we're tracking fairly closely uh, to our budgeted expectations on an amended budget and original budget basis. Again, reduced fare subsidy coming in as expected uh, and non fare box totals coming in uh, slightly below expectations. So overall, uh, we're again, tracking budget pretty closely down about four and a half million on an amended budget basis and positive by about four million on an original budget basis. So again, much different story this year uh, than where we were at this point last year. With regard to our expenses, we continue to keep uh, tight controls on those. Uh, we see labor coming in positive by about $1.1 million. Uh, material continues uh, to track pretty close, slightly down to budget 
Fuel and Power have been very strong performers for us over the last several years, and they are the same here this month. Uh, and then we have injuries and damages and security services coming in either at budget or slightly positive. And then other expenses uh, continue to come in uh, favorable by about three and a half million on an amended budget basis and about 2.7 on an original budget basis. So overall, uh, we're a little over $6 million favorable on the amended budget and uh, favorable by about 5.3 million on the original budget basis. When you net this against our revenues, uh, we're about $4.8 million positive on an amended budget basis and $4.7 million positive on an original budget basis. So again, it's nice to see some positive uh, you know, numbers there, which dovetails into the year-to-date numbers. Uh, again, seeing similar trajectory on the various lines, dropping down to the bottom uh, row here, we see total operating expenses. Uh, on a year-to-date uh, basis, a little over $27 million favorable on an amended budget and a little over $38 million favorable on the original budget, which again, netted against the revenues, uh, we see about $22.7 million favorability on the amended budget basis and a little over $42 million favorable on the original budget basis. So again, uh, this has been helpful to us uh, as we talk about the uh, CARES funds here in a moment. With regard to our public funding, uh, we continue to see very strong performance uh, from our public funding revenues, uh, in part due to the uh, the addition of online sales into the uh, larger you know public funding portfolio. Uh, so this has helped us uh, attain very favorable results vis-a-vis uh, -vis our amended budget and original budget basis uh, expectations. So we see sales tax coming in uh, about fourteen million dollars to the positive. PTF coming in a little over 9 million. Uh, RET continues to perform very well, a little over 4 million plus or minus, uh, and then almost $2 million of favorability between PTF on RET and ICE funding. So that leaves us for the month uh, about $28, $29 million of favorability, whether you're looking at it on an amended budget or original budget basis. This again follows a form that we've seen over the last several months where we see uh, year-to-date numbers, again, dropping to the bottom line here. Uh, where we see over $110 million of favorability on the amended budget basis and almost $120 million of favorability on the original budget basis. So again, very strong performance from our public funding. And then uh, if you flip to the next page here with regard to CARES draws, uh, again, CARES was the first package of federal funding that we received. Uh, we, because of the fact that we have seen uh, you know, positive variance, both on the system generated side of the house uh, and particularly on the public funding side of the house, uh, we have not needed to draw as much as we had originally anticipated. Uh, so we still do have CARES funds available, about $80 million uh, to draw down uh, through the remaining portion of uh, 2021. Uh, you know, that may need to be supplemented uh, in the latter months, we'll see. Uh, with CRISA funding, uh, which was the second tranche of funding, but that will carry us into 2022. Uh, so again, a uh, little bit better results than what we had originally anticipated, meaning that we are only needing to draw down uh, for the current month right now about $7.6 million, which uh, aggregates up to $741 million of the total 817 or a little over 90%. With regard to the three commodities that we purchase, uh, again, we're locked in for the near term. Uh, we are uh, finalizing the fuel RFP and we'll be looking for selective purchases in outer years based on market conditions. Uh, but we are looking, uh, you know, as well as for power and natural gas, but we're locked in here for uh, the foreseeable future. So again, uh, we've been able to take advantage of market conditions. We'll look for additional market conditions uh, to make selective purchases in the future. With that, that concludes my uh, prepared remarks for the uh, FAB. Uh, I'll open it up for questions on the FAB before turning it over to Molly Poppy to walk through the summer promotional fairs. Jeremy, can you explain the impact of online sales in the current month results? Yeah, so um, online sales, uh, you know, we, we received previous uh, to this year, we received a small portion of online sales, but it was under an archaic structure and formula. 
Um, now we're capturing kind of the full breadth of online sales, which has boosted uh, the results that we've seen, uh, you know, 10 to 15 percent. So again, uh, having online sales coming up online, so to speak, uh, has been very beneficial to us in the total receipts that we're collecting uh, and has been a big boost for us um, in any time, but let alone during the pandemic, uh, to see those online sales coming uh, into the coffers. And again, that will be baked into the cake as we continue to move forward. Uh, so this has uh, been a big benefit to us uh, and, and one that we're very happy to see the results for 2021 uh, manifesting themselves. Um, Chairman, Chairman Silva, um, before I move, before we move on to any further questions from you or from the rest of the board members, and we have another component of the finance committee report that's going to follow up on Jeremy and that's Molly Poppy. She's going to make a, a presentation now and then we'll come back uh, for questions for, for both of them from everybody. All right, Molly. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Good morning, I'm Molly Poppy. I'm the CTA's Chief Innovation Officer. And we wanted to, to give you an update on the uh, fair promotions that we launched this summer. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, CTA did launch a discount on three existing pass products that we had. We reduced the one day promotional, uh, the one day pass from $10 to $5. We reduced the three day pass from 20 to 15, and we also changed the CTA only, CTA only seven day pass from $28 to 20. Along with uh, decreasing the, the pass products, we also launched a marketing campaign that you see there on the right that uh, was encouraging individuals to adopt those promotional fairs and take CTA to some of those fun summer activities that were happening. While we had initially planned to end the promotional fair pilot after Labor Day, due to the success of the promotional fairs and also the ongoing uncertainty that we have around the Delta variant with the return to ridership, we did extend the promotional fairs through to November 25th, 2021. Next slide. A couple key highlights uh, on the promotional fairs, CTA did deliver over 10 million rides through those promotional fair products throughout the summer. We also saw an increase of ridership throughout the summer. We were uh, delivering approximately 3.4 million trips uh, in May, so right before the promotional product. And then in August, we've risen to 4.3 million weekly trips. That's adding about a million weekly trips uh, throughout the summer. We also, our busiest uh, ridership week was due to Lollapalooza. And uh, specific to one of the past products that we did see really exponential growth was the one day pass. Uh, we saw a over 300% increase in one day pass use compared to 2019. And what's really great about this past product is the increase was primarily driven by bus riders. And we also saw a large adoption uh, of riders on the south and west side and in low-income communities, really demonstrating that the affordability of that one-day pass product was encouraging individuals to move away from a pay-per-ride and move into that one-day pass. Uh, on the revenue side, as we all know, anytime you know, there's a drastic reduction in pass prices, there's a concern that there will be a significant decline in revenue to the agency. But with these promotional fares, we haven't seen a significant decline in revenue, in fair revenue. In fact, throughout the summer, we've continued to see revenue growth uh, due to the increase uh, in ridership. Next slide. A couple key, uh, a couple other metrics that we wanted to, to note here. Uh, CTA did perform a survey of riders who purchased a promotional pass to understand how that pass may have impacted ridership behavior. And uh, we had 60% of respondents indicated that the promotional pass had them ride more. 43% of, of that group said they rode a lot more with only 17% indicating they rode a little bit more. And also what's really telling about this number is 20% of uh, respondents indicated that the promotional pass actual, actually got them riding. And so that's really a, a key indicator of the success here is not only was the promotional passes uh, encouraging people to ride more, it actually did get people on, on the system and get, did get people out riding again. Uh, next slide. Uh, the last the, the last insight that we want to give is really comparing the promotional passes 
to the 30 and seven day or 30 pay per use pass that we didn't change. So as I mentioned, the one day pass saw exponential growth in, in use. We had a 328% increase. And this is comparing uh, pre, pre promotion to post promotion. The three day also saw growth. It was uh, a 44% growth or 15,000 uh, more uses of the three-day pass compared to pre-promotional, and then the seven-day pass saw a 75% growth. Now, the 30-day and the full fare uh, pay-per-use or pay-as-you-ride, we did not make any changes as part of this promotion to those. And what you actually saw is a slight decline in 30-day use, uh, looking at pre-promotion to, to current or, uh, or after the promotion was launched. And while we did see pay-per-use growth, which is indicating to us that there's still some room to attract more riders out of that pay-per-use and into some of these passes. Um, and what we really want to, to continue to see with these passes and what we'll continue to analyze is how, is how people are switching out of that pay-per-use and switching into those passes. And if we are really seeing a growth of growth in ridership. And one last thing that, that I'll point out here is when you compare uh, riders that were riding on the promotional pass and riders that were riding in pay-per-use during this time period, we also saw an increase in rides. So we actually saw 70% in rides during the summer months for individuals that bought uh, the promotional pass. So they were riding 70% more uh, with the promotional pass than they were pre-promotion. And then when you look at pay-per-use during that same time period, those pay-per-use riders were actually riding the same amount pre-promotion and with the promotional pass. So we, we're going to continue to analyze this and continue to look at the results here as we move into the fall and try to identify some other opportunities that may exist to further encourage individuals to adopt a pass and move into riding more, uh, riding more on CTA. And with that, uh, Jeremy and I uh, can answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Molly and Jeremy. Uh, Chairman Silva, do you have any further questions for uh, Jeremy? Or I don't. No? All right. Uh, Director Barkley, do you have any questions? I do not. Okay. Uh, Director Alvaro Zalas? Uh, I don't. I just want to make a, com a couple of comments, I guess, to Jeremy and team. You know, thanks for keeping the cost down. I think it's made such a big difference because we didn't think the CARES Act was going to be stretched this long. And so much of it is due to the efficiency of the work that everyone is doing. So kudos to that. And on the promotional fairs, I just keep hearing great things from everybody, you know, out there in the public uh, with regards to the promotional fairs. I think they really appreciate it. They see it. Um, I'm curious, though, are there, you know, based on what we're seeing, it doesn't look like it from the from the data, but are we thinking there are any downfalls to this at all? You know, are there any concerns in the long run, I guess, with regards to this? I can only see positives, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't think that there's there's never a downfall when we increase ridership. And, and that's really the focus as we think about recovering from, from COVID and how we can get individuals back into their riding, riding pattern with transit and sort of get over that first ride anxiety. What we hear a lot from people is they have a concern coming to transit for the first ride. But once they get over that first ride, they really, it's like riding a bike. They, they get back into it and they're back used to, to riding transit and really see it as a benefit. So I don't really, really see a downside. I think any time that we really are increasing ridership and encouraging individuals to ride the system, that's that's a positive for the agency. Okay, great. No, good Dr. job. Rosales, yes. But, but, um, the, to, to further amplify on, on Molly's answer, you know, um, the pricing around our, our passes is something that, as you know, it has been a subject of a lot of discussion over the over many years in terms of do we have it set at the right price point, so on and so forth. I think one of the things that the the one day pass uh, experience in particular has told us is that it was really overpriced um, given what we were going to do. The challenges that we have faced in the past around this issue has been the financial risk that it would take to reduce passes. Um, uh, and and fear the corresponding lost revenue that would come from that, which was 
you know, if we were carrying 1.5 million people a day, which be, would, would be a much bigger hit on our budget than, than you know, the, the number of rides we're carrying currently. And so one of the, if there's, if there's any opportunity that's come out of this pandemic, uh, and I, I say that with a heavy grain of salt, um, is that it's allowed us to experiment on things that would have been much more difficult for us to take the risk to do if we were running at a normal level of service and, and ridership. Uh, and so this is an example really where the team has kind of put their heads together and said, let's try some things and see how they work. Uh, and we were pleasantly surprised at the results. Um, uh, I think that that it is indicative of the type of innovation that we're going to have to, to pursue going forward as we try to grow our ridership back and really get our revenues stabilized again under what whatever may be, quote, the new normal that we're going to be facing around transit usage going forward. No, and I think it's really great that as we're doing it, uh, we're collecting the data, right? We're taking a close look at the data so we can monitor and we can figure out, you know, as you were saying, uh, what is that price point that works best for all involved, um, especially not only the ridership, but also the income, because that is a balance that we have to keep. So great job. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Irvine, any questions? Um, no questions. Just, yeah, I do appreciate um, the creativity you're showing in trying to find ways to get people back in and back on the system. Thank you. Director Jakes? Uh, no questions, but I think that President Carter summed it up well. You know, opportunities in a pandemic. And Jeremy and Molly, you have definitely done an awesome job with that. You know, so thank you. And thank you for your leadership, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Director Miller, any questions? Uh, just want to say good job, good job. And Molly, what, this promotion started in May, didn't it? Yeah, it was extended to November. It started in May? Correct. We started it right before uh, Memorial Day, and then we extended it through to uh, November 25th of this year. That's great. Okay. So we've got more than a half a year. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, thank you all. Um, that concludes uh, that uh, final report. Chairman Silva, we may come to agenda item number four. Our next order of business is the review of an ordinance amending ordinance 020-108, approving the fiscal years of 2021 to 2025 capital improvement program. Michelle Curran. Good morning. I'm Michelle Curran, Vice President of Budget and Capital Finance. I'm here today to present an amendment to the 2021 to 2025 Capital Improvement Program, or CIP. In November 2020, the board approved the $3.4 billion CIP, and the CIP is being amended, was amended in May, and we are proposing a further amendment to incorporate additional known changes. The amendment is being done to include several grant awards. First, a low or no emission federal grant for $8 million to fund electric buses and charging infrastructure. Second, CMAC funds of $3 million transferred from CDOT as part of its Drive Clean Chicago rebate program, which will also provide funding for the electric bus program. Third, federal safety demonstration and research funds of $1.5 million for a pilot project to install new safety features for the electrified third rail. And fourth, to include the final award amount for the annual transit security grant funding, which includes $3.9 million for T CTA's transit cybersecurity and risk mitigation project, $4.9 million for CTA's rail station video management system upgrade, and $5.1 million for the Chicago Police Department to provide transit dedicated teams. Uh, finally, we have $625,000 for the United Work Program or UWP planning funds for program development. The net increase due to the amendment is $20.5 million, revising the 2021 to 2025 Capital Improvement Program to $3.416 billion. Be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, Michelle. Chairman Silva? I don't have a question. Um, Director Barkley? I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Director Alvaro Rosales. No questions. Um, Director Irvine. Questions. Thank you. Uh, Director Jakes. No questions. 
Director Miller. No questions. Are there no further questions, Chairman Silva? There are no further, since there are no further questions, I can need to place this item on the omnibus for board approval. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded by uh, Jakes and um, Irvine. Um, we may now move to the contract, sir, uh, starting with B as in boy one. Our next order of business is contract number B1, a change order to a material contract. Questions, Chairman? I, I don't have a questions. Okay. Uh, Director Barkley? No questions. Director Al Rosales? No questions. Uh, Director Irvine? No questions. Uh, Director Jakes? No questions. Director Miller? No questions. Uh, Chairman, we can proceed to B2. Our next order of business is contract number B2, a jobs order contract. I don't have a question. Thank you, Director Barkley. Uh, I don't have any questions. Director Alvaro Rosales. No questions. Director Irvine. No questions. Director Jakes. No questions. Uh, Director Miller. No questions. All right, um, we can proceed to F1, sir. The next order of business contract number F1, an investment services consulting contract. Mr. Chairman? I don't have a question. All right, Director Barkley. No questions. Director no. Alvaro Rosales. No questions. Director Irvine. No questions. Director Jakes. No questions. Uh, Director Miller. No questions. All right, um, move the final contract, then G is in girl one. Our next order of business is contract number G1, a change order for technology services report. I don't have a question. Director Barkley? No question. Director Al Rosales? No questions. Director Irvine? No questions. Director Jakes? No questions. Uh, Director Miller? No questions. Since there's no questions, Chairman Silver, we need to remove this contract from Yamaha, so we will need to vote on it right now. We'll now entertain a motion to recommend board approval of contract number G1. So moved. Second. Been seconded by uh, Directors Jakes and Miller. I'll now take a roll call vote. Um, Director Barkley. Yes. Director Al Rosales. I'll abstain. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Uh, Chairman Silva. Yes. That motion is approved with five yes votes and one abstention by Director Alvaro Rosales. So Chairman may now proceed to 5A. Since there are no further questions on the contracts, may I have leave to place the contract numbers B1, B2, and F1 on the omnibus? So moved. Second. Moved by Director Jake, seconded by Director Miller. We can moved. proceed to B, sir. Chairman Silva. Since there is no further business to come before the committee, may I have a motion to approve the omnibus and recommend the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. Moved by Director Jake, second by Director Miller, we'll take a vote on the omnibus. Um, Director Barkley. Yes. Director Al Rosales. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Miller. Yes. Chairman Silva. Yes. That motion is approved with six yes votes, so we can move to agenda item number six. And finally, may I have a motion to adjourn? It's all moved. And I second. Moved by Director Jake, second by Director Irvine. Let's take a vote on the adjournment. Uh, Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Al Rosales. Yes. Director Barkley. Yes. Chairman Silva. Yes. Uh, the motion to adjourn is approved with six yes votes, and there'll be about a five minute break before the full board will meet. Thank you all.
Recording in progress. Uh, good morning. This is Greg Longini of the Chicago Transit Board. Again, we're about to start uh, the meeting. Chairman Barkley, you may begin the regular scheduled Transit Board meeting. Good morning. I would like to call to order the regularly scheduled meeting of the Chicago Transit Board for September 15, 2021. Would the Secretary call the roll, please? Yes. Director Miller. Here. Director Jakes. Here. Recording in progress. Here. Uh, good morning. This is Greg Longy. Here. Director Al Rosales. Here. Chairman Barkley. Here. Uh, we have a quorum with all six members of the board present and let the record show that uh, President Carter and Deputy General Counsel Jansen are also in attendance at this meeting. Our first order of business is public comment. <laughs> Yes, we have one public comment speaker today, uh, Laura Saltzman. Uh, so Laura, you may begin, and if you could keep your remarks to three to four minutes, that would be appreciated. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Laura Saltzman. I'm the Transportation Policy Analyst for Access Living, a disability rights organization located in Chicago. I am here on behalf of the Transportation Equity Network, a coalition of 40 community groups and organizations in Chicago and suburban Cook County working on embedding racial equity and mobility justice into transportation to speak in support of CTA establishing a transit ambassador program. With lower ridership during COVID, there has been an increased perception of safety issues on transit and widespread news coverage of public safety incidents. The perception that transit is unsafe discourages people from using it. There's concern that there may be permanent decreased ridership if people do not feel safe on buses and trains. However, an increase in law enforcement or other armed guard presence is no cure-all. Transit riders are disproportionately likely to have had negative interactions with law enforcement and fear an escalated response if their behavior is seen as threatening or abnormal. Regretfully, law enforcement in Chicago simply does not have a reputation or a history of de-escalating. The recent report by Transit Center called Safety for All provides insights into the potential of reimagining safety on transit. Since simply increasing police presence can generate additional risks for many riders, transit agencies need to shift resources toward public safety programs that acknowledge that a safe system can mean different things to different people. More holistic approaches that make use of unarmed customer service and social welfare personnel should be used to reduce interactions between riders and the police while building better support for vulnerable riders." End quote. This is why we wholeheartedly support the creation of a transit ambassador program on CTA. We want people to feel welcomed onto trains and buses. Safe, not over police during fear. At Access Living, we view disabilities holistically, which is why we are happy to sign on to a program that would train transit ambassadors on how to interact and help people with a range of disabilities, with a special focus on de-escalation for people with mental health issues or for those who seem to be on the verge of causing disruptions. An ambassador program staffed by unarmed personnel ex explicitly trained on de-escalation measures has seen success in San Francisco on Bay Area rapid transit. And this spring, the Los Angeles Metro Board of Directors unanimously approved a motion funneling $40 million for the creation of a transit ambassador program. The concept of such a program is consistent with where the state of Illinois is moving. The natural extension of the work that Access Living and our allies achieved with the passage of the Community Emergency Services and Supports Act, or CESA, signed into law last month. CESA mandates a non-law enforcement response for people in crisis throughout Illinois. So, we are asking CTA to fund and develop during its next budget cycle, a transit ambassador program with people who are trained in how to deal with disabilities and de-escalation. We need a program that welcomes all who want to ride transit in Chicago. This would be an eligible and very appropriate use of COVID re relief funds. So this program could be started immediately. The members of the Transportation Equity Network would be eager to partner with CTA to help shape this program. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, for sharing uh, your thoughts and concerns this morning. Uh, I'll uh, ask Director, I mean President Carter, to, uh, <clears throat> to send it to the appropriate staff person for consideration and, and discussion. And we hope to get back to you soon. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Saltzman. And uh, Chairman Barker, that concludes uh, the public comment section of today's meeting. Our next order of business is the approval of the minutes. I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting of August 11, 2001. So moved. Second. By Director Jake, second by Director Irvine. I'll take the vote. Uh, Director Miller. 
Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Silva. Yes. Director Alvaro Rosales. Yes. Chairman Barclay. Yes. That motion is approved, sir, with six yes votes. Our next order of business is executive session. It is my understanding, Brad, that there's no executive session today. That's correct, Chairman. Since there is no other board matters, our next order of business is a report from the Committee of Finance, Audit, and Budget. Director Silva. Committee on Finance, Audit, and Budget met earlier this morning via Zoom video teleconference. The committee approved the August 11, 2021 committee minutes. The committee reviewed the finance report. The committee reviewed the following ordinance, an ordinance amending ordinance number 0220-108, approving the fiscal years 2012-2025 capital improvement programs. The committee also reviewed four contracts. The committee approved the ordinance and all four contracts. The committee placed the ordinance and three of the contracts on the omnibus. Recommended board approval of the omnibus. Contract number G1 also approved by the committee was not placed on the omnibus and will require a separate vote. That concludes my report, Chairman Barclay. Thank you, Director Silva. May I now have a motion to approve the omnibus as stated by Director Silva? So moved. Second. Moved by Director Jake, seconded by Director Miller. I'll take a vote. Omnibus. Uh, Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Silva. Yes. Director Alvaro Zales. Yes. Chairman Barkley. Yes. The motion to approve the omnibus passes with six shifts votes, sir. Our next order of business is contract number G1. I will now entertain a motion to approve contract number G1. So moved. Second. And seconded by Directors uh, Jakeson and Miller. I'm sorry, by Director Jakes and Irvine. We'll take a vote. Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Yes. Director Silva. Yes. Director Alvaro Rosales. I'll abstain. Chairman Barkley. Yes. That motion is approved with five years votes and one abstention by Director Alvaro Rosales. Our next order of business is the construction report from Bill Mooney. Good morning, Bill Mooney, your Chief Infrastructure Officer. Uh, we'll start this month's report where we normally do our Your New Blue Signals project between Jefferson Park and O'Hare. You can advance the slide, please. Project remains on uh, budget, but tight to schedule. Since we last met, uh, we have started the cutover formally at Old Manheim Relay House, made a lot of progress there. We continue to clear up discrepancies and install the rest of the remaining wayside equipment for the upcoming cutovers at River Road and Cumberland. Next slide, please. Um, so here's some of that wayside equipment being installed at River Road. River Road is two cutovers out, so we'll finish up Old Mannheim and then move on to Cumberland. Here they're putting the wayside signal apparatuses in place. Ultimately, those then get wired up to the house in kind of the pre-testing phase before that cutover. Next slide. Um, here they're installing cameras at Old Mannheim as part of the, uh, the commissioning process there. So actually is our new standard for our, our wayside signaling equipment. We have camera installations that go back to those houses, allow people working the tower panels locally there to be able to see the interlockings more, but also allow us to observe other issues that may be going on in the right of way from those locations. Next slide. And here they are wiring up the house at Cumberland. So Cumberland is our upcoming cutover. And um, so this is all localized wiring. So from all those wayside devices, like the signals I, I just showed you in the first picture, they then wire those up to internal, you know, um, components in the house that help the logic tell them what the wayside stuff to do. Next slide, please. Uh, my next projects are refreshed and renewed. The project uh, continues on, on schedule and on budget. Um, 
you know, so we've added a new section to talk about. So this is upgrading directional line diagrams at 29 stations. Uh, this is localized signage that occur that's at stations that show you the rail routes and kind of the, you know, where, where those stations go on the line from where you're at. Um, Irvine had raised with staff that not all the, the older stations had um, signage that, that represented which stations were ADA accessible. Um, and so as part of the Refresh and Renew, we're doing a campaigned effort to get all that signage upgraded as part of the effort uh, with this program for this year. So whilst I'll be reporting on the progress of those stations, no, there's nothing formally updated on the slide. It, it kind of, it's a timing thing, but just as a sense, we're about halfway there already. We've we made a pretty good push on these 29 stations. So next month, you should see a pretty significant amount of progress reported. Um, also, in the upcoming month, you'll start seeing the SBE contracts reporting progress as well. We've had kickoffs, and those contractors are starting to get work on painting those stations. And so you'll see kind of progress showing up in the upcoming months with those. But moving to the slides, we've been focused predominantly at um, Kedzie on the orange line and Kimball on the brown line. So here you can see the upgraded LED lighting of the bus turnaround outside the Orange Line station. So the Refresh Renew isn't just focused on that rail terminal. It actually takes it outside the footprint of that station into the bus terminal. So here is the waiting area for the buses outside Kedzie Orange Line station. We've upgraded all that lighting to LEDs. Next slide. Um, and we've also done a bunch of concrete repairs. So you know, over time with the, the plows and the, and the freeze-thaw cycles, those curbs and, con and sidewalks do see a lot of cracking. And so here, we, here we've actually replaced a section of the, uh, the concrete curb and repaired it. And you can see the before and afters with those. Next slide. And inside the station. So uh, this is the curtain wall along the stairwell. This is, kind of protects the stairwell from the outside elements um, on the platform level. And there's a lot of deterioration at the bottom of that curtain wall and rust. So we've had to cut out a section of that sheet metal. They patched it, they browned it down, and then they've done a fresh coat of paint on it. Next slide. Um, and here's some before after LED lighting. Again, kind of one of those most, uh, most significant impacts is the lighting and L upgrades and that painting that goes with it. Next slide. Here we are, Kimball Station. This is one of the stations I regularly use, and you can see the sense of the before and after here in the night photo with that LED footprint. This is outside the station, and this really gives you a sense of what what impact that lighting also does on the security around our stations. Right? It it, it increases that foot panel, that approach. Um, you know, with bus terminal waiting there for the 81 Lawrence is right there out in front of the station with the public art there, and so it really makes a big impact in how that station interfaces with the neighborhood too. Next slide. And here's uh, again the lighting upgrade on the platform level. You get the on the left the before photo and on the right kind of the, the after photo, and you can see kind of the difference. If you look at the platform level, how much how, how much more the increase of lighting footprint is. Next slide, please. Um, my next project is our Jackson Park track and structural improvement projects. So most of the, most of the track work at this point between 59th Junction and 61st Interlocking is complete. Um, we changed out rail kind of on the southbound track and since we last met. Um, and we're moving towards 61st interlocking. And then the structural work continues to in ongoing progress in advance of the track work. There's a couple photos for it. Um, so here is that renewed rail and ties on the southbound track. Um, you get a sense kind of in the foreground and the picture on the right of kind of that older system to the newer system on the other side. Next slide. And here's that ongoing structural work. Here they're, they're actually changing out the fixed connection. So um, the, the long piece there is the stringer, and that's actually what the rails are sitting on top of, and that connects into a cross girder that distributes that weight of the structure to columns and ultimately to the ground um, in the structure. So there's a lot of load potentially in that connection spot. It also sees a lot of deterioration, and so they're breaking out and re, re um, doing those connections there. Um, my next project is our South Shops Waste Material Storage and Sewer Upgrade. Project is on schedule and on budget. Uh, since we last met, we've actually completed all the wall stabilization work, um, the roof repairs, and now we've actually moved into the sewer work uh, as part of this project, and, and that's significantly completed. So we'll move on to some pictures of this work. So here you can see they're, they've, they're doing flashing repair on the roof over that area where I was showing you, showing the, uh, tying together that wall and that ante space, and then they tie it into a new guttering system and downspout. Uh, next picture. It ultimately gets run into a new sewer line underneath the sidewalk there. So here they're digging up the sewer line. Part of the big issue we had here is the sewer had collapsed outside, and that's why we were seeing some of the settlement of the building itself. So we actually had to take up the whole sidewalk, replace the main sewer there that runs along it, and then redo all the kind of water connections for that. Uh, my next projects are Dan Ryan inverters and battery updates. So we've completed completely at 59th interlocking and moved on to 63rd interlocking. Um, and we can move towards some pictures. So here's similar to what you saw at 59th Street. 
They're installing the new inverter equipment. This is how we take a, a robust DC power system that, that our substations run on and run our signal houses on it to give it a redundant supply that's really, really rich. Um, so here they are installing that new equipment and wiring it up. And next slide. Um, and here they are working on the commissioning effort of that equipment. So 63rd interlocking is, is, has been commissioned at this point and they'll be moving on in the next upcoming report to 47th interlocking, which is a little different because it's an elevated interlocking. So you'll actually see some structural work that goes with that. So I have a new project this month. This is our northbound state in Dearborn project. Um, this is part of our fast tracks program. It's one of the last projects in that program. This was a mid-con contract that has a value of 6.5 million. It's being constructed by Kiewit. They'll be renew renewing localized track work on the northbound side of the State Street subway, as well as in the Blue Line subway um, near Division Station, both on the northbound and the southbound track. There's a couple in, um, reroutes in the, in the Red Line subway to facilitate this work, and then there's some long single track weekends on the Blue Line to facilitate that work in the upcoming weeks. Um, so. This is similar to what you saw last summer on the southbound side. Here they are doing concrete inspection of the ceiling. So as we've had water infiltration in the, in the subway, we've had to knock down any loose concrete, re-inspect the structural elements, the rebar associated with that. They recoat the rebar and then we'll reseal the concrete. So here's an engineer actually doing some sounding inspection in, of that concrete. Next slide. Um, and then we also do a bunch of crack injections. After we actually remove the wall panels within the station at Roosevelt. These are the sound panels expose the concrete wall so we could get in there and do some uh, water crack injection. This is where we drill holes and fill kind of voids behind the wall with uh, concrete fill so that then it stops water from in infiltrating the subway. Next slide. Um, and, and here over the next couple of slides, a big focus of the work in the, the State Street subway was actually replacing a series of the concrete ties at Roosevelt Station. This was actually one of the earliest installations of concrete ties we had done on our subway system. And those ties are kind of aged out and we're showing some, some strain and deterioration. So we broke them out in place and then next slide. And then they form them up. Uh, and then on the next slide, they fill those forms with concrete and create new concrete ties. And then that sets over a period of time before we run service on it on a Monday morning. I'll turn it over to Chris if there are any questions for me at this time. Yes, um, we'll ask questions for Bill first. Um, Chairman Bark, did you have any questions? Sorry, right. I do not have any questions. All right, uh, Director Alvarez Ali, any questions for Bill? No questions. I I just I do want to say it was interesting to see um, something as simple as lighting, like on Kimball, the major difference that it makes. So you know, thanks for all the work that you're doing because it's it's dramatic, and and I know that. As nice as it looks aesthetically, it's really uplifting, I think, for, for our writers to see all the changes. So thanks for all the hard work. Thank you. I'll pass it along to the team. Thank you. Uh, Director uh, Irvine, any questions? Um, no questions. Just, um, yeah, great work. And thank you for including the, um, the uh, ADA info and infection line diagrams during that work. Appreciate it. Thanks for adding that to your report. Thanks. Uh, Director Jakes? Bill, I have a question for you. Uh, are these are these outside contractors or are they CTA employees? Um, so, so the pro projects we've talked about here are a mix of, of both, actually. So, the refreshed and renewed program is mostly CTA employees. Um, though we do have those SBE paging contracts that are coming online, you'll start seeing some of those reporting of those. So, those are that is an outside contractor under the Jackson Park track and structure work. That's all internal resources, CTA employees. And all the other projects I talk about are contractors, sir. And so there is a, a, I see Juan Pablo on here. So there is a, a DBE component to those outside contractors? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's correct, sir. When, when right. we have an outside contract, we evaluate all of them, all of them for a DBE goal. Okay, thank you. Director Jakes, in your full package that you receive every month, there's actually a broader version of the construction report um, that has some infill slides. It has the details about the DB percentages and what's reported to date. So if you are curious on any of those contract jobs, there is a reference point in, in a presentation um, to those. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Director Miller, any questions? I uh, just wanted to ask Bill, on the uh, stability program, the 29 stations, that number was chosen where, where the location, and I think you said you're about halfway. Uh, with the, in the process. Sure. Uh, so, you know, 
uh, a while back, we changed our, our signage standard. And so when we were installing these directional signage at station, we started incorporating the ADA uh, locational references to those signs. So this, this, the 29 stations are the stations that do not have that upgraded signage left. Um, you know, it was a goal at, at kind of Director Irvine's request to make sure that we get all those signs upgraded. So we made it part of this campaign to make sure we could get the rest of the system cleaned up and up to that standard. Okay. And, and it's, and it's, and it's solely, a, the, it's solely signage upgrades. Right, right. Okay. But I, it, I know you said 29, it, but it, it including the ones that was already up includes all sides of the city. That yes. All, okay. Yeah. Those were the remaining 29 stations that didn't meet the new standard. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Silva, do you have any questions? No questions. No questions. All right, then we're finished with questions for uh, Bill Mooney, Chairman. We we will now, sorry, go ahead. We're now calling Chris Michelle and Ron Pablo Prieto to make their RPM and diversity presentations. Thank you, Chairman. Chris Bouchel, your Chief RPM Officer. Uh, the project continues on budget and tight to schedule. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. And the next slide. A um, lot of work. Um, we, uh, in particular, on the um, red-purple bypass, um, this is the piece of work in the area of the Belmont Station, um, we continue to <clears throat> build and finish the bridge. So many of the systems, including track, you'll see some photographs of that in a few minutes, are being installed um, on that bypass or that bridge um, as we speak. Um, in particular, as well as the track and other systems, traction power signal, um, we continue working on the tie-ins at both the, um, the north and the south ends of the bridge. Um, so it is a challenge to build a bridge in a, in a dense urban context, um, but the biggest challenges are really ahead of us in terms of um, actually connecting to the system um, during various uh, types of uh, you know, track access occurrences and impacts to service so that we can uh, install those tracks and systems in those two areas. Um, and then Lawrence to Brynmar modernization. Um, it's, it's a big project. I've explained a little bit about how um, some of these impacts um, relative to demolition, uh, of the viaducts relative to uh, demolition of some of the track structures um, and the installation of the uh, the foundations, um, which are called caissons, um, how that would uh, spread throughout this Lawrence to Brynmar segment. And we're seeing the, the impacts of that um, work moving forward. Um, so you'll see some photographs that uh, show, show what we were talking about in some of our earlier explanations about how this work would um, be a necessary precursor to actually assembling the bridge in that area. Uh, and, then, and then finally the stations, the four stations. So if we could go to the photographs, that'd be great. So again, this is the bypass. Um, this bridge is, is the most complete of, um, of the bridges on the project so far. Um, you can see we're in the process of installing track. Um, you don't see it quite as visibly, but we're installing traction power and beginning the uh, process of installing a signal system um, for the bypass as well. Not quite as complex as some of the sig signal systems we've installed on the two interlockings that were a preparation for the, uh, the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr segment but still um, something to give a lot of care and attention to as we go forward in the project. Um, next slide. So some of the decorative items, um, important as well, because they do have a function, which is to control noise. Um, but you can see the installation of the uh, sound walls up here that continues um, and get a sense for the sweep and size of, of the bridge um, in this photograph. Next. Demolition. Um, so the demolition continues on existing viaducts. Um, these are the two tracks, obviously, that are not in service um, on the east side of the uh, of the viaduct in this area. Um, so generally speaking, um, where these viaducts go over main, you know, larger streets, um, arterial streets, uh, we are closing those streets down over the weekend to do the demolition. Um, in various neighborhood streets like Catalpa, um, that demolition occurs um, on weekdays and the street is closed for an extended period of time um, in coordination, obviously, with the neighborhood um, and the aldermen and local businesses. Um, next slide. Uh, the installation of various anchors. So um, one of the things you've seen pictures of is the installation of an earth retainage system between um, in the middle of those four tracks up there. Um, that is basically a, a big piece of corrugated metal. Um, that piling is vibrated into place um, and then we further strengthen that. It goes down anywhere from uh, from 15 to, uh, to 25 feet, um, pretty far into the ground, as you can imagine. Um, and then in various places, we also install tie-ins. Um, these are structural 
natural uh, cables that go down or shot into the ground, drilled into the ground, and then um, placed and set against the opposing wall and add further strength to that earth retainage system. So that's what you see here, soil anchor installation. Um, next. So the uh, caisson or drilled shaft installation, the foundations, if you will, um, are also underway up here. Um, so these are drilled down um, 60 to 80 feet into the ground. Um, generally on this project, we're drilling um, all the way to bedrock and then attaching those foundations. Um, they're being rock socketed, um, which is a great word, um, into the bedrock. And then uh, we pour, we install a rebar cage and then pour concrete. Um, so that work is also underway up in this area. That is a necessary precursor to installing the columns above. And then once the columns are done to install the, uh, the gantry and then start the assembly of the bridge, um, later this year uh, in the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr segment. Next. And outreach continues. Um, not only working very closely with Juan Pablo and his group on various outreach efforts, um, as well as overall compliance, um, but also on just getting out to the community and increasing the knowledge of the project. Um, within that community, that includes um, uh, updates for the 44th Ward, uh, actually all the wards in the project, um, Uptown United, um, we're, we're getting ahead and talking about some of the station closures that have happened, um, uh, and uh, the Vautravers relocation, we had to have a community watch party that was um, pretty successful and generated some goodwill, particularly among the, uh, the sort of four to ten year old um, level. <laughs> Um, the, um, we do various types of outreach at, at, uh, local, um, local activities that are happening, um, local events that are happening in the footprint of the project. So North Halstead Market Days is an example of that. You see our government and community relations director, uh, uh, Jeff Wilson here in a photograph, um, at the North Halstead Market Days. Um, again, various outreach, uh, eff eff efforts to the, to the wards. Um, and then we have uh, both real and virtual <laughs> office hours where we endeavor to answer questions from the community um, about our project. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Juan Pablo. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good morning, directors. Juan Pablo Prieto, Director of Diversity Programs. Uh, Diversity continues to uh, meet with the contractor monthly to discuss DBE and workforce outreach and compliance. We also continue to send out opportunities from the contractor to the DB community so they are aware of the trade packages and how to submit their bids. On August 19th, diversity staff attended the St. Paul's Community Development Ministry Construction Apprenticeship event uh, to speak about the opportunities on RPM and other construction projects and how to start your career in the trades. Uh, we, discussed, uh, opportunity, uh, we discussed how to connect with our workforce partners and how to connect with CTA to find out about future opportunities. As I presented the last two months, we will begin transitioning our RPM diversity presentations from outreach to compliance as Walsh Floor completes their subcontracting awards. As of August 31st, DBs have been awarded over $169.5 million between the design and construction packages. Additionally, those $169.5 million have been awarded to 71 unique firms. This is a result of the outreach that has been conducted by CTA and the prime contractor to ensure the entire DBE community is aware of the opportunities on the project. One of the goals of RPM was to engage with DBE firms that had never participated on a CTA project. Some of these firms are well-established and some are new to the industry. Of the 71 unique DBE firms on the project, 25 are new to CTA. That concludes my portion of the report. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you both. Um, Chairman, do you have any questions for either of our two presenters? I do not have any questions at this time. Uh, Director Alvaro Rosales. Um, no, good work. Juan Pablo, though, I, I do have a question. So the 169.5 million, what percentage is that? Maybe I missed it. I know. That's, the... It's roughly 13 and a half percent of the total contract value. Uh, so they're working their way to get to that 20% uh, goal. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Irvine, uh, uh, questions for this element? No questions, just uh, enjoying the update and seeing the, per the progress. Thank you. Uh, Director Jakes? No questions. All right. Director Miller? No questions. And finally, Director, so do you have any questions for either Chris or Juan Pablo? Director Silva? Um, 
questions. No questions. Thank you, sir. Um, Chairman Parker, that concludes the questions on um, the various construction reports presentations. Thank you. Our next order of business is new business. Greg, is there any new business? Uh, no, sir. Not that I'm aware of. Since there's no further business to come before the board, may I have a motion to adjourn the Chicago Transit Board meeting of September 15, 2021? At 1042, I don't know. I think I might want to stay to 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> it's in but, your hands, but, sir. But you know, since every, since everyone else looked like they're ready to leave, I'll just say so. How about that? <laughs> like smoking like a preacher, right? <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> so moved by Director Jakes. And I second. And seconded by Director Irvine. I'll take the vote. I think I know what it's going to be. Uh, Director Miller. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Irvine. Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> That's a yes from Director Irvine. Uh, Director Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Director Al Rosales. Before I say that, I just want to remind everybody that today begins Hispanic Heritage Month. So hopefully everybody celebrates with us. And, um, and that's a yes. Thank you. Um, and then finally, Chairman Barkley. Yes. Uh, six yes votes on the adjournment motion. So uh, we are adjourned and see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you.